Well, let's get started. Welcome back to the uh, third day of our three-day boot camp. And I'm going to be talking to you for two hours, with a break in the middle, wherever it's convenient, for about computational patterns and auto-tuning. And so here's the outline. And you've heard this several times now, so let me just summarize it in one bullet, which is that if you want to write parallel programs and you don't want to spend an enormous amount of time doing it, you got to recognize known solved problems, useful patterns. I talked about some of those yesterday. Those are the mathematical ones, like am I doing discrete event simulation or particle methods, those kinds of patterns. And then if, for example, I have to solve linear systems, am I, do I want to use Gaussian elimination or is there all this structure and I could use FFTs and multigrid, right? That's the mathematical patterns. Then there are the computational patterns, the seven motifs. I'm going to be talking about those today and I'll review them on the next slide. And then there's how do you glue together these computational patterns to make your whole big program, and those were the structural patterns that Kurt Koitzer talked about yesterday. So what I want to talk about is how to optimize, make run as fast as possible, these seven computational patterns. And for some of you, 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 know, you're, you might be interested just in where do I find the best one. Uh, doesn't matter how, how well it's done. I'll give you some hints about how to find that information. And, and, but I'm also going to talk in some detail about the insides and what are the principles by which we try to optimize them. And in fact, some, some uh, theory which says some of these are optimized as best as they will ever possibly be. So there, for some, in some cases, we can actually do that. And so the main theme in a lot of this, for a lot of these motifs, it's going to be easy to see the parallelism. If you're multiplying two matrices, there's lots of multiplies and adds that you can assign independently. The tricky part is to minimize the most expensive operation these computers perform, which is moving data around, maximizing locality, as I described before. That's the hard part. And so we have to minimize communication, minimize moving data between levels of the memory hierarchy, you know, between DRAM and cache, and between processors over the network. That's the hard part where all of the, you know, the hard thinking goes. And it turns out that even if we have the basic idea of how to do that, if there's some theory that guides us in how to do it, there's still a huge design space, a zillion different ways to implement it. And historically, people tried to tune that by hand. But what it's just turned out to be too tedious and too hard. There are too many thousands or even millions of different potential implementations. You're not going to try those all in and pick the fastest one. Instead, people write programs to try them all, to generate cleverly a large set of possible implementations and pick the best ones. And that's called auto-tuning. So I'll be telling you how that happens in a number of these um, uh, motifs. And then, even if you've done all that, it's still rather complicated, right? There's still a lot of you know, a complicated interface to give hints, how do I choose the best implementation? And I'm just going to have one slide at the end, which is describing a current research project here in our PAR lab called CGITS, which is trying to make this all accessible as easily as possible. You write Python in the simplest possible way, for example, a high-level language like Python, and it will automatically, dis and, and you'll give it a few hints. I'm using this motif, it has this structure, and it'll go try to find the right auto-tuner to use for you. So that's a longer term project, and I'm just going to give you a sort of a one slide summary at the end. And there's lots more uh, information. I mean, this material has been developing over many years, and there's the one semester version of this course that talks about it. You know, if you're interested in the linear algebra part, I'm teaching a course this semester on it. And in fact, another course, which is sort of you know, uh, a, sem a research seminar, CS294, where we're going to go through the algorithms that have been invented recently that provably minimize communication. And there are lots of papers on that website. Okay, just to remind you, here are all of the seven motifs that people decompose their uh, applications into. Dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, operations and structured grids, which means, you know, you take your four nearest neighbors or whatever on a two-dimensional array and just compute some weighted average and you do the same operation at every grid point. The same operations in unstructured grids where you have, you know, you have to have pointers to all your neighbors, they vary. FFTs, particle methods, and then the uh, embarrassingly parallel stuff. I don't have time to talk about all seven of them. I'll try to talk about those four, uh, the first two in, in some detail and the last two in a little bit less detail. Now, people have worked on the other ones quite a bit. And in fact, if you call an FFT in almost any platform today, it has been auto-tuned. This has been you know, very successfully done. People explore many, many different FFT implementations and pick the best ones automatically. And I'll give you pointers to the uh, other projects, the websites that have done that, but I won't, won't talk about that. 
So, so once you've decided you want to use a particular motif, you're going to do linear algebra, there are a bunch of questions to ask about it. You know, what problems does it solve? Just because the word linear algebra covers a whole lot of different possibilities. And if there's many ways to solve the problem, how do I pick the best one? And then the question is, all right, now I've decided that I need to do this particular problem. How do I find the best software? Well, the word best, right, depending on your problem, it could mean the fastest. That's mostly what we're talking about. But sometimes it could mean the most accurate, depending on your problem. And for most people, actually, it means the fewest keystrokes, right? So A backslash B. It's hard to beat typing A backslash B in MATLAB if you want to solve a system of linear equations. It's not necessarily very fast, but it certainly minimizes keystrokes, right? So there's all these different approaches. And then I'll spend most of my time on how do you design the best implementations, what's the design space look like, and how do we search it. And there's going to be you know, a number of successes I describe in lots of current work. So let me just go to the top and say, you know, in the case of linear algebra, which has been worked on for a long time, there are a lot of well-written books. I'll say that because I'm a co-author on some of them. Uh, so that describe the software, the LA Pack manual, the Scala Pack manual, uh, this is a guide to, and these are both for dense linear algebra, and these are two books about sparse linear algebra that sort of say, if your problem, it sort of gives you a, design, a, um, a decision tree. I'll show you a picture of it later. If your problem has these properties, uh, how do you pick the best algorithm? It's a function of all the properties of your problem, either for solving linear systems or for solving eigenvalue problems. And in fact, people have tried to automate this. There's a website maintained by the National Bureau of, what used to be called the National Bureau of Standards, uh, NIST, and so you go into it, and at the top it says, are you solving ODEs, are you solving PDEs, are you doing linear algebra, are you trying to do interpolation, you click on that, then they ask you more questions, you click on that, and finally, after many, many clicks, it says, well, try this software. So people have tried to, to organize that. It's not organized around performance at all, it's sort of more around functionality, but there's many different tools to go find what you want. So, so now let me go into the, the, the model that we're going to use to decide if we have done a good job in optimizing our code. So I'm going to go back to optimization here. And, and this is you know, minimizing communication. So the, the mental model that we're going to use throughout the talk to say, is my algorithm fast or not? And I'm going to count three things, three contributions to the running time. I'm going to count the number of floating point operations. I'm going to count the number of words moved. And that could be you know, between DRAM and cache, if I'm thinking about that problem, or between processors. And I'm going to count the number of messages performed. So, you know, an MPI send, you learned that, that's a message. But all, or when you go to a disk and get something, that's a message. When, or when you go to um, DRAM and get a cache line, that's a message, right? It has a bunch of words in it, and there's an extra cost for each of those. And so the total runtime of your algorithm is the number of flops times the time per flop, plus the number of words moved divided by the bandwidth, plus the number of messages times the cost per message, which is called the latency. So I'm just going to add those three terms together as my model. It's quite accurate for lots of different machines. And so I want to minimize that. So the question is, which of those three terms is most important? Well, let's look at the, the coefficients, time per flop, reciprocal bandwidth, and latency. They're orders of magnitude apart, right? It can cost hundreds or thousands of times uh, as flops to do move one word or to move one message. And they're all getting better. I mean, technology is improving but they're getting better at very different rates. In fact, they're growing apart exponentially. So the time per flop is improving at about 60% a year, but the bandwidth on the network or, in the, is, or the memory between DRAM is only improving at around 20 to 30% a year, and the latency is only improving much, much more slowly, 5% or 15% a year. So even if your algorithm is not dominated by communication this year, it may be dominated next year or the year after. So the point is, when we ask ourselves what's the right thing to do, we may be willing to use an algorithm that does a lot more floating point operations, because that's dirt cheap compared to everything else. And so we're going to allow ourselves to do that in our optimization. And so our goal is to reorganize all the motifs to do provably as little communication as possible. Right? Sometimes we have proofs, sometimes we don't, sometimes we can just sort of have intuition that we're doing as little as we can get away with. And of course, we want to minimize that not just between, you know, Two processors, we want to minimize it everywhere. It costs to move between L1 and L2 cache, between L2 cache and DRAM, between different DRAMs over a network, right? All those layers you've got to worry about, which is one of the reasons the design space for these algorithms are so large. Now, you could say, well, can't I do communication in parallel with computation? I mean, that's parallelism too. That's a good idea. That's called overlapping communication and, and the computation. 
But you know, in the best possible case, if I'm only overlapping two things, my speed up is a factor of two. I mean, that's good. We'd like a factor of two, but we're going to get much, much larger speed ups by just not doing the communication in the first place. So you don't have to believe me that this is a good idea. You can believe somebody at a higher pay scale. So, and this is a quote from President Obama's uh, budget request to the Department of Energy, um, and it's a very long document. And the, but there are a few pages of highlights, and one of the highlights that they mention. We just repeated the motivation I gave, which is on modern architectures, communication takes much longer than the performance of a floating point operation. And it says that OSCAR researchers, so DOE researchers, have new algorithms to minimize communication between processors and the memory hierarchy. So, and this is specifically referring to a DOE package, but the algorithm they're referring to was one we developed here. Uh, it's a iterative solver called GMRES, which I'll tell you about. And it also depends on a new dense linear algebra one, which was also work done here. And uh, so you'll hear about that later. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about Trilinos, which is one of these big DOE packages, there's a short course on that downstairs during these same three days. OK, so, so let me come up with a really simple metric to look at an algorithm and say, can I, is there any possibility that I can minimize communication? I mean, is there some lower bound on how much communication I have to do without thinking very hard? So what I'm going to do is for an algorithm, I'll just count the number of flops it does, F. I'm going to count the number of words of data it needs, just what's, how big is the input? I'll call that M. And I'm going to take their ratio, and I'm going to call that the computational t intensity, the number of flops per word. So if that, if that ratio is small, 1, so I'm doing one floating point operation per word, then I'm, I'm doomed. I, the algorithm cannot possibly run any faster than the memory speed, right? I've got to get one word out of DRAM and then do work on it. So, so algorithms with low Q are bad. But if Q is large, then I have the potential to read a bunch of words from memory, leave them in cache, do lots and lots of work on them, you know, Q times as much data. And then if I, I might only be limited by the speed of arithmetic. So what we're going to do is look for algorithms with a high Q. Now, that doesn't mean that any implementation of that algorithm will do a good job, but that's a necessity. We, that's a requirement. So it, it gives us a chance to start searching. OK, so let's start now, if there are any, that sort of introduction. Let's go on to the dense linear algebra motif. And I'm going to start with a little history, a uh, brief history of dense linear algebra software. So in the beginning was the do loop. OK, so this goes back a ways, the early 60s. But that was enough to build libraries that were quite popular at the time, like IcePack. That did linear algebra problems. And so people thought about, you know, all right, we wrote that all by hand. Is there a better way to do it? And there was a standards committee formed, and they invented something called the BLAS-1. And this is a standard library of operations that people recognized appeared in this library over and over again. And they're very simple loops, things like dot products, axes, multiply a scalar times a vector and add a vector y to it. And so why did people bother doing this? They were common patterns to ease programming. You know, if you were on a, a vector machine, you could you know, implement this with one vector or two vector instructions. And so then people said, OK, let's rebuild the library using these. And they invented LinPack for solving linear systems. That's also the source of the name, the LinPack benchmark, but it's not the code. So why were these called BLAS1? Well, there was one loop, basically. You know, if it's a dot product, it's one loop. And you did order n to the 1 operations and order n to the 1 data. They're very, very simple. So what's the computational intensity? Let's look at this guy. You gotta, you're going to do it in a vectors x and y are of length n. I'm going to do 1 multiply, 1 add, so 2n operations. And I have to read x, read y, and write y, so 3n memory operations. And the computational intensity is 2 thirds. It's terrible. And so there's no chance to minimize communication there. So you need something faster. And a few years later, people decided, OK, let's try to go from BLAS1 to BLAS2. And so this is a, a larger library of 25 operations, on, on usually on matrix vector pairs. And the simplest one is multiply a dense matrix times a vector. Gem V is the name of it. And then there's a scalar, and then another, add another vector to it. But there was also other things like multiply a column vector times a row vector. That's a rank one update. And also solve triangular systems. And why were these called BLAS2? Well, they're two nested loops. And they did n squared operations. And they did it on n squared data. So did this make the computational intensity any better? Well, if you look at matrix vector multiply, I'm doing two n squared operations on n squared data. And so my computational intensity went from 2 thirds to 2. It's an improvement. It's still not great. 
You still, it, but it was good enough for vector machines of the day. Okay, but it's really not good, but, you know, if memory gets more and more expensive, two is not good enough. Okay, so what, what comes after two? Three. So people had a, yet another committee called the BOS Three Committee, and they decided to implement a standardized library of nine operations on matrix-matrix pairs, of which the canonical example is matrix-matrix multiplied, called GEM. And so, and there are also a few other versions where the things are symmetric and where you're solving many triangular systems, things like that. So why are they called BLAS3? Well, the obvious implementation is now three nested loops, and you're doing n cubed operations to multiply n by n matrices, but you're only doing it on n squared data. So what's the computational intensity for matrix multiply? I'm doing two n cubed operations on n squared data. I have to read a, b, c, and write c, so I'm doing four n squared memory operations, and now my computational intensity is big. N over two, right? It's as big as you want for big matrices. And so now we have lots and lots of tuning opportunities if we do things cleverly. So how much faster can the BLAS3 go? Let me just show you some, some old data. So the horizontal axis is the dimension of the matrix. The vertical axis is the number of um, megaflops. You can tell it's an old machine if I say megaflops. And uh, this is the three nested loops run through the Sun compiler with all the optimizations turned on, running at about 30 megaflops. And here are two optimized implementations running at least 10 times faster and pretty close to the peak speed of the machine, which is 330. One of them is the vendor hand-tuned blahs, that's the red curve. And the other one is an auto-tuned version, which was based on this code generator that searched for the best implementation that was developed as a research project here many years ago. Okay, so here's an example of the kind of speed up on this purely sequential speed up. So what is the idea that's ne necessary to get this to work? So here's a little cartoon of what the unoptimized code looks like. I have three nested loops. What is the inner loop doing? It's taking the dot product of the ith row of A, the jth column of B, and computing one entry of C, right? That entry there, the ijth entry. So what does, what's the main trick to get this big speed up? I'm just going to do it blockwise instead of entry by entry. So now I still have three nested loops, but the nested loops are over blocks. Of, B, of size b by b. So each of these little bigger squares is b by b submatrix. The inner loop still looks like a dot product, but now this multiply says multiply this matrix times that matrix. So this is really a b by b matrix multiply. And the reason we're saving memory traffic is I can read in that whole b by b matrix, that whole b by b matrix, do b cubed operations on them, all in cache, and, and I get all the work done without any more memory traffic. And so this is the basic idea of how you go a lot faster for matrix multiply. So let me show you an experiment um, and to just give you a hint that that's not all you need to do. So for many years now, we have run a class project where we give the students the slides you've just seen and accounts on uh, some fast machine of the day, and we give them a week to matrix multiply as fast as you can go. So this is the code we give them down here, and it's running at about 15% of machine peak. So the vertical axis is machine peak, and each of these dots is a different T from 2009 when we gave the course, and how fast they got after a week of work. And so we give them this course, this uh, algorithm running at 15% of peak, and their goal is how close can you get to the hand-tuned code in the ACML library running on this Opteron? And of course, the GSI, Vasily Volkov, is a very clever person, and he got very close to machine peak without writing any assembly language or anything like that. And here are all the other student teams. And you can see that many of them didn't do a whole lot better. So that's because there's just lots and lots of other optimizations. I mean, it's necessary to do what I just described. If you don't, you get 2% of peak, right, if you write three nested loops. We get up to 15% by doing that. But there's all this other stuff that's very machine dependent. Some people use different compilers. Some people used SSE intrinsics. Um, and so anyway, depending on all, and some people unrolled the loops in funny different ways. And so this is a motivation for why hand tuning is kind of a pain. You want to do auto tuning. Here, let me give you one more piece of data from how hard these students worked in their one week of effort. So they started with that code and their goal was to get there. So here is a plot of the fraction of peak they attained versus how many lines of code they wrote on a log scale, okay? So we gave them 32 lines of code and some people generated, how could they have generated 16,000 lines of code in a week? Well, they actually wrote an auto-tuner. I mean, they knew this stuff existed, so they in one week wrote an auto-tuner and generated 16,000 lines or 32,000 lines or, and just searched them all, right? This is one week's work. Actually, our sophomores do it now. 
This, is now, this class is now, this assignment is now given in our sophomore programming class, and we have sophomores produce auto-tuners. And in fact, the last time uh, Dave Patterson did this, there was one team that beat Intel's hand-tuned code, so needless to say, we hired that undergraduate in our lab. So, um, so but you can see that, that you know, you have to, it, there's a lot of code to write to get this done, which is one reason you want to do it automatically if possible. Uh, the GSI, who's very clever, didn't write all that many lines of code, and he did the best. Okay. So why is doing, let me just give you sort of a hint of what the design space looks like. I'm going to take a two-dimensional subsection in the very high-dimensional design space. And so these two axes are the sizes of two sub-blocks at the register level. So you know, I'm going to not just have the blocks that fit in cache, I'm going to have blocks that fit in registers. And so I have to decide how big are the blocks that fit in registers. And I'm going to say on this particular ancient machine, which only had 16 floating point registers, I have a total number of 16. This uh, number of rows in the register block times the number of columns has to be less than 16 to fit. So here are all the reasonable possibilities. We try, the code generator generated them all, and they're color coded by how fast they went. And so we didn't bother looking up here, and there's the winner that ran at about 600 megaflops. It happens to be... Uh, Three by four. Why? I don't know. It's just one of those, it, it depends on all the details of the hardware, exactly how it was unrolled. And so this is really a needle in a haystack, right? This is a tiny piece of a much higher dimensional space, and this is why you want to have it done automatically. So people now do this quite regularly. I mean, these are old slides. It's been adopted widely to do it, not just for FFTs, but for matrix multiply. And so here's an example with a lot more data on a lot more recent machines. So each of these... Uh, columns uh, corresponds to a different machine, and, the th and what I'm showing you is how fast the vendor blahs went, how fast the auto-tune blahs went from this package called Atlas, it was written by a collaborator named Clint Whaley, and how fast the basic three nested loops work. So you can see that auto-tuning is close to or beats what the vendor did in almost all these cases, and it's a heck of a lot faster than the three nested loops, which is the brown. So, so this has been widely adopted. A lot of vendors you know, start with this and then do their own tweaking at the end to try to make it go faster. OK, so, so let us now uh, ask ourselves, are there any lower bounds that guide us so we can decide, I have found the best algorithm? So, and I'm going to start by talking about matrix multiply and tell you what is known about it. And so I'm going to assume that I'm going to take I want to ask myself if I'm going to do the usual n cubed operations to multiply two n by n matrices. Can I provably find the best algorithm? And so if you've heard of Strassen, that's an algorithm which actually does n to the 2.8, right? I'm not going to worry about those algorithms right now. I'm just going to think about the usual n cubed operations and ask, suppose that my three matrices fit in my big slow memory, but they don't fit in my, my cache of size m. Is there a lower bound on how much data I have to move in order to get my matrices multiplied? And there's a theorem, which goes back to 1981, which says no matter how you organize those n-cubed operations, there's a lower bound on how much memory traffic there has to be. And the answer is n-cubed divided by the square root of the cache size. Okay? And no matter what you do, you have to move that much data. And that's actually attained by the algorithm that I showed you, where I did things by block. I bring in blocks. I fill up the, mate, uh, fill up the, the cache with blocks of size square root of m by square root of m. And that actually is attained there. And, and so this theory is very useful to tell us we found the right design space. I mean, we don't have to search an infinite number of different implementations. This theory guides us to basically what the implementations look like. So this was known for a long time. And, what's, uh, and what that led to is to rewrite all of linear algebra uh, to use matrix multiply in the innermost loop. Right? We know how to do matrix multiply quickly, so what people did I and a, and a bunch of other people, we went back and we said, can we reorganize all of linear algebra so the inner loop is calling matrix multiply? Because I know that's going to run fast. And that led to this package called LAPAC. And so what we had to do, for example, was look at Gaussian elimination. And the natural way we all learn Gaussian elimination is you add one row to the next row to zero out something. That's a Blas 1 operation. So they all had to be reorganized so that the inner loop is doing Blas 3 instead. And that's been done systematically over the years. And so the algorithms that can be reorganized so that you spend almost all your time multiplying matrices include linear systems, variations of Gaussian elimination, and least squares problems. But at that time, we couldn't, do any, we couldn't actually do that successfully for finding eigenvalues 
or for finding singular values. There, at the way we did it, we could only but do about half the flops in matrix multiply blas 3, you know, which we could do fast, and the rest were done in blas 2, which we c couldn't do very fast. Nonetheless, this is a widely used package. It's sort of the standard package. I will give you a list of who uses it later. And it's all publicly available. So, what, so that was all sequential stuff, optimizing for that. Obviously, this is, this is all about parallelism. So how do you make LA pack parallel? Well, if the blahs are parallel, if you're on a shared memory machine, and when you call matrix multiply, it, that, that way works. But that doesn't scale up to big distributed memory machines. And so there was another package, which was started in 1995, and it's also the standard uh, implementation of this motif that's available. It's called Scalapack, for scalable LA pack. It uses distributed memory, MPI, has rather more complex data structures. I won't show you the pictures, because you have to spread out your matrix into all the different processors. And we have you know, ongoing NSF support to continue to develop this and, and improve it. Um, since it's so much harder to write MPI code than, than the other kind of code, we only have a subset of LAPACS functionality available. We have ideas for the other algorithms, but this is still work in progress. So how successful have these packages been? Basically, if you ever solve a system of linear equations in any computer, you're using these packages, right? It's been adopted by the MathWorks, so A backslash B, and all these other companies. And you know, our website has you know, millions of hits every year. And there's, there's one particular article that I kind of like. Uh, I'll just tell you about it. This was a, a cover article in Nature where they were analyzing cosmic microwave background radiation. So the question is, you know, if you look out at the, at the universe, there's all this background radiation, and it's not uniform. It sort of tells you what the universe looked like at the beginning. And the question people have been trying to, an have been trying to answer for a while is, based on that information, can we figure out whether the universe is going to expand forever and keep getting bigger and, you know, bigger and bigger? Is it going to eventually slow down and gravity will bring it all back together and we'll have another big bang? Or will it sort of just eventually stabilize? And that turned into a big, dense linear algebra problem based on all this data. They sent up satellites to, and, you know, they had cameras on, on this balloon, and there were cameras aimed at the sky, and they got, collected re background radiation from every pixel in the sky. So this was like a million by million matrix with lots and lots of pixels. And the winner is the universe is going to expand forever, but it's going to slow down asymptotically. So the reason I think this, you know, so I asked myself, what is the practical impact of this? And I figured, well, maybe if the universe expands forever, you know, real estate prices will go down eventually. But it's a very long-term effect. So anyway, so this is uh, you know, some of the examples of which dense linear algebra comes up in, in doing science. OK, so much more recently, we asked ourselves, OK, do the algorithms that we've been building for a long time, do they provably minimize communication? For a long time, all we had was this one theorem from 1981, which said for matrix multiply, there's a lower bound. And we realized we could extend that theorem. And it extends basically to all, of, all direct linear algebra, both dense and sparse. That same lower bound that they had back then applies not just to matrix multiply. It applies to all the Blas operations. It applies to LU, to QR, to eigenvalue problems, you know, the, the works. It applies not just to dense matrices, where you're doing n cube flops. It applies to sparse matrices. And of course, you may be doing a lot fewer flops. And so the lower bound doesn't have an n cubed in it anymore. It has something else. It works in the parallel and sequential case. It gives you a lower bound on how much uh, uh, data has to move between processors. And it'll deal with memory hierarchies. So, so first, we proved that theorem. And then we went back and we asked ourselves, well, do all the algorithms that we have there get anywhere close? And the answer was no. Almost none of them were anywhere close to the lower bound. They all did asymptotically more, moved it more asymptotically more data than necessary. And since then, we've discovered basically new algorithms for all of dense linear algebra, which, do, which are asymptotically faster, which do asymptotically less data movement than all the classical stuff that you, that you know. And so we were in the process of re-engineering all these algorithms, and we have lots of support to do that, and, but there's still lots of open problems, and we're hiring people. Um, and, and it also extends to those Strassen-like algorithms, but that's, that's sort of a, a harder story. So let me just give you a hint of what one of these new algorithms looks like. And it's going to be the QR decomposition. So if you remember from sophomore linear algebra, something called the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. You're given a bunch of vectors. You want to replace them with a bunch of orthogonal vectors by taking linear combinations. And so that's what the QR decomposition computes. Q is all those orthogonal vectors stacked together. 
and r is a little triangle which says what linear combinations of them give you the original vectors. So the question, and, and so the question is, how do I perform that quickly? And so let me just sort of draw the picture for um, a matrix which is tall and skinny, so many, many rows, just a few columns. And suppose it's spread out over four processors here, just to keep it simple. So processor zero owns the first quarter of the rows, processor one owns the next quarter of the rows. How am I going to do this and minimize communication? So I'm going to start by, without communicating at all, I'm going to just, each processor is going to independently compute the QR decomposition of what it owns. Right? This is not the answer that I, I want, but it's a step in the right direction. So without any communication, every processor does that. And then I notice that what I've implicitly computed, I'm not going to write this down in the machine, is the product of my original matrix as a product of this block diagonal orthogonal matrix and this stack of four little triangles. So that's not what I want. I want one little triangle, but four is where I'm going to start with. No communication yet. Then I take that stack of four little triangles, and I just have each processor talk to its neighbor. And so each processor now shares one little triangle. So I have two little triangles, and I do its QR decomposition. So I've only had to talk to one neighbor with one message. And again, I notice implicitly I've computed, I factored this guy into the product of this little block diagonal matrix times now just half as many triangles as I had before. Then I take those two little triangles, do one more communication, put them together, do its QR decomposition, and I finally end up with orthogonal matrix times R. And so what I've implicitly computed is the product of my original matrix is the product of this block diagonal orthogonal matrix times that one, times that one, times R. And that is my implicit representation of the answer. So the answer consists of this list of little orthogonal matrices and the final output R. And anything that you want to do mathematically with the usual way that Q is represented, this is not the usual way Q is output from the algorithm, you can do it <coughs> excuse me, equally well and much, much faster with this implicit representation. So that's what the algorithm does. So let me just draw a cartoon of that algorithm. All I did was a reduction operation. So here are my four processors. Each owns a quarter of the rows. All I'm going to do is call MPI reduce, if you like, and I'm going to take from every pair of processors, I'll take its submatrix, put them together, and compute an R. And I'm going to keep going up the tree, and I find the R that pops out is the one that I want. That's the parallel algorithm. But I want to minimize communication even if I'm on a different kind of machine. So what if I'm on a sequential machine? It's the same algorithm. I'm just going to use a different tree, a different shaped tree. So now suppose that I can only fit a quarter of my matrix into, into cache. So the matrix starts in fast memory. I'll bring in the first quarter of the matrix into cache, do QR. Then I'll bring in the next quarter of the matrix, stack that guy on top of that guy, do QR, and then bring in the next quarter of the matrix. I only have to read the matrix once from main memory, as opposed to many, many more times. I, mean, one, I can't read it fewer than one, one time. And again, I, get my I finally get R out, same R as before, but I get a different list of Qs that represent the answer. What if I'm on a dual core machine? Well, I might need this kind of pattern, in which is sort of a mixture of the, the other two, Sometimes I'm trying to, you know, I'm doing it this way because I have two processors, but I also want to minimize how many times I go off the multi-core chip to, to DRAM. And what if I have a real computer, right? It's multi-core and multi-socket and multi-rack and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to use a different tree. And the tree is going to be chosen dynamically depending on what, who's connected to whom and all of that stuff, what resources I happen to have when I call it, and that will minimize communication. The answer is going to be have a different data structure every time I call it, but it's still going to be a, you know, an equally good, usable QR decomposition. Okay, so that's sort of the theory. What kind of speed-ups do I get? Well, here's some examples in a lot of different architectures. So this is comparing it to the best previous implementation, so 8x on that platform and 6.7x and 4x and 13x on, on Tesla. This is, this is an interesting one. This is on a grid. This is four French cities. And you can imagine how long it takes to move data between French cities. And, and the, what we compared it to is running scale pack on one cluster in one city. We got perfect speed up on four cities, right? That's, I mean, if you tried to run the usual algorithm sending data over the internet, it would be a disaster. It would never finish. We also have it up and running on the cloud. And we don't know how to make measurements yet. That's kind of a project for this coming semester. But it does run perfectly well there. Um, it's not quite map reduced because you have to leave some data behind. But we have some new... So infrastructure that the uh, lab here, the AMP lab, is building for, for use on clouds. And those are parallel speedups. In the sequential case, you could sort of say we have infinite speedup. Now, what does that mean? 
So when my graduate student ran this code on a very big matrix on his laptop and used the standard algorithm, it never finished because it was thrashing the disk. But the new algorithm only ran two times slower than as though he had an infinite size DRAM. And so in this case, the, 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 the communication minimization is disk IO. Okay, so it's the same idea. Okay, so let me go, this is my last slide on the history and now the future of linear algebra. So we're in the process of trying to come up with these provably communication minimizing algorithms for everything. I mean, we, we're, it's sort of, we're in a rapid innovation mode right now. We have a bunch of papers due Friday. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a project called PLASMA, which is trying to put these in a multi-core environment. PLASMA stands for Parallel Linear Algebra for Scalable Multi-Core. And, and, and this is a, a project that my colleague Jack Dongera is leading at the University of Tennessee. And so the main uh, innovation there, in addition to the communication avoiding stuff, is dynamic scheduling. So all of these, all these little jobs, these little dense matrix operations are are uh, created uh, and, they're, uh, and they're scheduled by a dynamic task scheduler. So whichever core is available, that job is shipped off to that core. So the other project that's going on is how do you make all this work on heterogeneous architectures like CPUs and GPUs? Where, you know, because you know, if one processor is going a lot faster than another, what do you know, lower bounds mean? Well, it turns out the lower bounds do extend to that kind of case. And a few years ago, we had a, a breakthrough in, try, in actually getting this stuff to work well. And uh, Vasily Volkov won the Best Student Paper Prize for his GPU, CPU implementations. And we're in the process now of trying to extend that to lots of other clusters of heterogeneous machines. And that project is called MAGMA, which is, a, again, a joint project with uh, Jack Dongera at the University of Tennessee. So there's a lot of code to write. And n a number of people are thinking about how to, opt how to do this as automatically as possible. That's certainly part of the MAGMA. Uh, research project and the Flame project has also been working on similar things at the UT Austin for quite a while. So since there's so much code, whenever somebody comes up with a new architecture, you don't want to have a big team of humans do it again. You want to automate it as much as possible. But there's still lots of open questions about how you combine that with, with auto-tuning. So that's the end of the first part of the talk, which is on dense linear algebra. And are there any questions before I move on to the sparse one? and get a drink of water. OK. So now I'm going to talk about uh, tuning a, a different motif, which is different in flavor. And so it's the same set of problems from a mathematical point of view. I want to solve linear systems. I want to solve least squares problems, you know, eigenvalue problems, a singular value decomposition. But the algorithms are going to be quite different. Because my matrices are sparse, that means there, there are very few non-zeros in them, and so I only want to store and work on the non-zeros. There are two classes of methods to make that work. Direct methods, which means variations on the classical stuff like Gaussian elimination and Kolesky and so forth. And there's iterative methods, where I'm doing an iteration like conjugate gradient or work or Lanchos. So I'm going to spend most of my time on the iterative methods. There's an enormous amount of work going on on the direct methods, and a very good survey paper, which is updated every year, uh, is available at this website. And what that has is a list of all the currently available parallel software for s doing sparse linear algebra that d does it by direct methods. And it's very nicely organized. You know, again, you know, depending on whether you're on a uh, distributed memory machine or a shared memory machine, and depending on whether your linear system is sort of arbitrary and non-symmetric, or symmetric and no other properties, or symmetric and positive definite, which lets you use Koleski, it has a list of all of the best available software and where the websites are to find it all. Uh, and we also produce some of that software, which I'll recommend. So SuperLU is one of those codes that scales reasonably well. So I don't want to go into more detail on that. That's sort of the high level, you know, where do you find the best available implementations? These codes are, you know, there's a lot of combinatorics and graph theory involved because of the sparse structure. So what I'm going to spend my time on, oh, and I should say, what about minimizing communication? That's very beginning work. We have, we know how to do it in principle for sparse Koleski for matrices that arrive from like finite element modeling. Uh, we, we sort of have done the theory, but we haven't done any of the implementation work. So there's still lots of open questions. But so again, what I'm going to spend my time on here is iterative methods. What is the, happens in the inner loop of iterative methods? you do a sparse matrix vector multiply. That's how you access your sparse matrix. You're not going to factor it. You're not going to change its data structure. All we need to do is multiply by it as quickly as possible. 
And the class of methods that depend on that and that are the most flexible and useful are called Krilov subspace methods, of which conjugate gradient is the classical example. So what you do is you have a starting vector, you do a bunch of matrix vector multiplies, you generate a bunch more vectors, and then in the span of all those vectors, the subspace, you know, any linear combination of those vectors, you ask, find me the best solution. And depending on the mathematical definition of best, you might get conjugate gradient or GM res or whatever algorithm you have. But the bottleneck for the next part of the talk is going to be, how do I make sparse matrix vector multiply go as fast as possible? The parallelism is obvious, right? Because there's just all these independent things going on. But if you don't do it right, it won't go very fast. Okay, so, so here is one of those decision trees that's available at one of those websites I was telling you about. How do I choose a method? So you might ask, is my matrix symmetric? And depending on whether you say yes or no, you might ask another question. Well, are all the eigenvalues positive? Well, yes or no. Let's say it's yes. Uh, do you also happen to know what the largest and smallest eigenvalues are? That's a pretty technical question. You don't often have that answer. And if the answer is no, you try conjugate gradient. Otherwise, there's another algorithm. If you happen to know this information, you can try conjugate gradient with Chebyshev acceleration. And depending on all of these different questions, which depend on your matrix and on your computer, it'll make different recommendations. And there's websites is down here which have this kind of decision tree both for solving linear systems and for solving eigenvalue problems. But all of these at the bottom eventually do sparse matrix vector multiply, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so here it is. I'm going to talk about automatic performance tuning, which is going to be a much harder problem for sparse matrix vector multiply. The main reason being that you don't know until runtime what the user's sparse matrix look like. So at runtime, you have to make a lot of potentially very expensive decisions. So how do you do that? I'll give you a bunch of examples, um, speed up results for both sequential and multi-core cases. And then I will tell you about the auto-tuner that we have uh, built called OSCE. Uh, OSCE stands for Optimized Sparse Kernel Interface. It's just coincidentally also the name of the Cal Bear mascot. Total coincidence. And this is available, that, you know, so you can call it at runtime, pass it your sparse matrix, and we'll hand you back a handle to an optimized version of it. And this is, you know, active research. We're now producing a version called POSCI, the parallel version. That hasn't been released yet. Now, all of that work gives you some good speed-ups that I'll tell you about, but you're still going to be limited by the fact that to multiply a sparse matrix times a vector, you're going to do two floating-point operations per matrix entry, right? A multiply and an add. And you're going to be memory-bound or communication-bound unless you do something else. It turns out that if you if you don't optimize just a single sparse matrix vector multiply, you have to optimize the entire solver, the entire CG algorithm, and reorganize it from, from scratch. Then you can minimize, you can get rid of much more communication. And so that will be sort of, you know, the, that's a, a big piece of our current research as well. Okay, so I want to contrast now automatic tuning for the blahs. We talked about that before, why that's easy by comparison with this problem. So, but the goal in general is let the machine do the hard work of writing all this code. The reason tuning dense plots is relatively easy is you only have to do it once per machine. So once per architecture. And so you can take as much time as you want. You can search, you can generate code for hours, for a week. These, some of these codes do run for a week. And when you're done, you have this wonderful matrix multiply routine. It's in a library. And at runtime, all you have to do is know a few parameters. You know, what are the matrix dimensions? You, and you can decide maybe which version of the algorithm to use. That's pretty easy to deploy. In contrast, with a sparse matrix, you can't do that because the algorithm and the data structure are going to depend on the user's sparse matrix. And I'll show you lots of pictures. Sparse matrices are all different, and they're all going to use different optimizations. And so um, the question is, what can we do offline where I have plenty of time to think about it? And how do I very quickly at runtime pick the right algorithm and, copy and, and, and do the right thing? So let me just say a few words about FFTs again. You'd think that FFTs would be like dense linear algebra, right? You spend a week, you find the best FFT for every you know, value of n, and you put it in a library and you're done. It turns out that hasn't worked quite so well because every n gives you a different algorithm. Th these, you know, so there, it turns out there's an amazing plethora of different ways to do FFTs. And so your library would have as many large algorithm implementations in it as the biggest FFT you'd ever want to do. They'd be gigabyte libraries. And vendors have found it difficult to get users willing to link in multi-gigabyte libraries. So this, is, this could be offline, but in practice, it's kind of done online. 
So just because of the size of the code. Okay, so let me show you some pictures of sparse matrices and try to explain why tuning is hard. So here is one spy plot, so the dot for every non-zero, of a, a matrix we got from a collaborator who's designing a linear accelerator down at Slack. And so the, the pattern describes you know, something about which piece this accelerator is connected to another. Here's one that came from some optimization problem in economics, and this is a very long, skinny matrix, a dot, 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 just a little section of it. You know, so this is you know, you know, who's connected to whom in the economy. And here's a sparse matrix every one of us and millions of other people use every day. So what do you think it is? It's the Google matrix, right, from a long time ago. I mean, it's billions by billions now. And so there's one row and one column for every URL, and there's a dot if URL i points to URL, has a link to URL j. And PageRank does sparse matrix vector multiply with this matrix to try to find the dominant eigenvalue and eigenvector to figure out how to list things. I mean, that, that was the original PageRank algorithm. So we all depend on this stuff. Okay, so what is the canonical data structure for uh, representing sparse matrices before we do any optimization? So here's my sparse matrix. The white entries are zero. What I want to do is minimize data movement. So I'm going to have as small a data structure as I can get away with. So I'm just going to pack together all the non-zeros. So the four non-zeros in row one are all packed together. The three non-zeros in row two are all packed together. I have to remember where they were, so I need another vector of column indices that say where they all were. And then I have to know where does row one start, where does row two start. So I have a third array of pointers, which just tells me where each row begins and ends. And then I have a, you know, a, a pointer at the end going off the end to say that's, that's the end. Okay, so that's going to be my simplest possible data structure, compressed sparse row. And how do I do sparse matrix vector multiply, given that? It's just, you know, very simple. It's still two nested loops. For each row i, I want to compute, uh, you know, y sub i, y is a times x. And so I'm going to loop over all the non-zeros. So I'm going to, in, in that row, so I'm going to go from pointer sub, you know, one up to pointer sub two. I'm going to go from there to there. And I'm going to go grab the value of the, of the matrix, the entry of the matrix. I'm going to go get an entry of x, but that's indirect addressing. I have to go to some random place in memory to get the right entry of x, do a multiply, and do an add. So this is going to be even more expensive than the usual loop because I have this indirect addressing. But in particular, I'm only going to do two flops for two memory references. And so my computational intensity is 1, th that ratio of 2 to 2, and I'm going to be limited by getting data from memory. So I have to somehow figure out a better data structure in order to you know, do less memory traffic. So let me just do a little experiment here and take a particular matrix. This is from a NASA structural analysis problem and sort of look at it and ask myself, what's a good data structure? So let me zoom into the upper corner. And I noticed that because I'm doing finite element analysis, all those little dots you saw were really little dense 8 by 8 blocks. So this should give us a hint that there's an obviously better data structure, which is that I don't need to store for, this, for these 64 numbers, 64 indices, right? I only need one index. I need to know where the upper corner is, and then I can figure out on the fly where everybody else lives. And I don't need, you know, you know 64 indices. One will do. So I can reduce one of my two data structures, my index array, by a factor of 64. So overall, I'm losing like half, half the, the, the memory traffic. So that seems like a great idea. So let's, let's do an experiment and try that. I'm going to represent this. I have to store all the non-zeros explicitly, but I'm going to have just one index for each. But while I'm at it, let me try some other experiments. I could also think of this not just as one 8 by 8 block. I could think of it as four 4 by 4 blocks, or as two 8 by 4 blocks, or, you know, 16 2 by 2 blocks. You can imagine. There are all these different combinations. Let me just try them all and see what happens. I'll do that experiment. So there's lots and lots of different possible data structures. And so here is a heat plot of all those different data structures and how fast they went. So this is where I store everything as one by one blocks, CSR. It's normalized to have speed one. There's the eight by eight case. It's going 1.55 times faster, so that was a good idea. But you know, here is the um, two by eight case. That's going 2.24 times faster. And there's the winner, four by two blocks. And it's going four times faster. Why? Well, I don't know, but that's the answer. That's what I want. I want, to, you know, I want to automatically discover that because of all the complexities of prefetching and SIMDization and, and register pressure, it's best to use four by two blocks. And that's what the search is going to automatically come up with and decide that that's what you want to do. Even though, in principle, this has less memory traffic, this is the winner by a large margin. 
Okay, let me just show you the bigger picture for this particular platform. It was Nitanium 2. So how did I generate this? I took a big dense matrix and I said, well, I can store a dense matrix as 1 by 1 blocks or 5 by 7 blocks or 12 by 12 blocks. Let me just try it all. This is data I can collect offline and use later to decide what, da what data structure I want to use. Here's how much faster it goes. There was that 4 that you saw in the previous slide, four, the speed up of 4. Uh, 8 by 1 works pretty well. Uh, you know, and you can see that all of these give you some speed up as labeled, but you know, there are only a few really, really good ones. So depending on my sparse matrix, I would like to go through this table and pick what is the right data structure to use. So, but while we're at it, let's just do a few more machines. So this is Itanium 2. Here are some comparisons of Itanium 2 to Itanium 1, Power 3 to Power 4. You'd think these were similar architectures, at least the manufacturer gave them similar names, but they differ utterly, right? So every time a new architecture comes out, you really do have to redo these experiments and do this installation time uh, exploration so you get these plots of which is the best data structure to use. And just for fun, here are a few more, right? They're always different, these heat plots. So, and these are, this is a Pentium 3 and a Pentium 3M, so they're actually quite similar. Okay. So, so let me do another example to try to explain why it's hard to pick the right answer. So this is, let's see, the EX11 matrix. It's a finite element fluid flow problem from NASA, I think. And so let me zoom into the upper corner and see if we see that same kind of structure showing up. And so that's what the upper corner looks like. And it has a lot of blocks in it, but there's, it's kind of hard to pick just one good block size. But three by three works pretty well. So let me just su superimpose a grid of, of what the data structure would look like if I used 3x3 three three blocks. The idea is that that 3x3 three three block would be stored with a single index. And so with that one, but that one has two zeros in it. So I'd have to fill them in, right? If I'm going to store this as a list of, of nine numbers, I would have to store explicit zeros there and there. And I'd store a lot of explicit zeros there, and I'd fill those in. In fact, this is what it would look like. All of those red dots would be added to my data structure. They'd be filled in explicitly if I insisted on storing this as a bunch of dense 3x3 three three blocks. And in fact, the ratio, how many more non-zeros do I get? Uh, half again as many. So the total memory traffic looks like this is not a good idea, right? I've gone from however many non-zeros I had before to 1.5 times as many. It turns out to be the right thing to do. You actually go 1.5 times faster by doing 1.5 times as many floating point operations. Remember, floating point operations are cheap. It's all about memory. And that's because the actual megaflop rate is 2.25 times faster. So this is not an obvious thing to do. This is done by auto-tuning, right? It's one of those explorations that is done. OK, so the question is, how do I decide this automatically at runtime? It, you can't afford to try to, to take your matrix, recopy it into every new data structure, and measure it, right? That would be the, the, the exhaustive search way to do it. That would take forever. So here is the. Uh, heuristic that we use. It uses statistical sampling. So offline, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a dense matrix and compute one of those charts that I showed you with, you know, 12 by 12, all those different colors. And that tells me how fast the matrix would go, how fast it would go in megaflops if I used R by C. So number of rows by number of columns, all the way from 1 by 1 up to 12 by 12. So I pre-compute that, take as long as I want. What do I do at runtime when the user hands me the matrix and I want to do this as quickly as possible? What I'm going to do is I'm going to sample A. I'm going to subsample it statistically, look at little pieces of it, and ask how many non-zeros would I fill in if I reorganized it to be R by C blocks. So in other words, for this picture, I'd only look at a little piece of this matrix and ask how many red dots do I get. And I, and I just hope that would be, give me a good indication of the whole matrix. And, so the, and I'm going to control the cost by, and there's some statistical methods. You can say, how, how much do I have to sample? You, basically, you keep sampling until the confidence intervals get narrow enough. And then, how do I pick the best R by C? Well, how do I pick the register size? I'm going to use this estimated time, which is how many non-zeros I have, divided by how fast it goes. That's going to be my time estimate, and I just minimize that time estimate. And that's how I'm going to choose the right block size. So how much does this all cost at runtime? Uh, this data is a little bit old, but we're, we're measuring it again. So it turns out that um, the most expensive thing to do is to take the original matrix and copy it into the new data structure. You have to, because that turns out to be the biggest cost, and that costs anywhere from 5 to 40 SPMVs. Just to change the data structure, do that optimization. So this is only interesting if you're going to do a lot of sparse matrix vector multiplies. And in practice, people with large matrices do do many sparse matrix vector multiplies. 
The heuristic is much cheaper by comparison. It only costs 1 to 11 to do this statistical sampling. And, and, and the good news is that in sparse solvers, we do, you know, you're going to do a lot of sparse matrix vector multiplies. So if you knew that the right block size was 3 by 3 and built it that way in the first place, you could save that time. And the, the thing is that since people often use the same matrix structure over and over again, what our auto tuner is going to do is have a little history table and, say, and the user can say, oh, this is the same matrix as yesterday. Just do the same stuff and you can save that time. So that the, the interface becomes quite complicated if you want to save all these, all these things. Okay, so how well do we do? Let me just sort of give you some examples over a database of 44 some matrices from, from different walks of life. There's a dense matrix to see what happens there. There's a bunch of finite element matrices, all with constant blocks, like all 8 by 8 or whatever. There's mixed finite element matrices where you have, you know, different size blocks because you you're have two different materials in it. Then a bunch of other sparse matrices of one sort or another, and a bunch of linear programming matrices which have as little structure as you, as, as you can imagine. The black and the vertical axis is the performance, so up is good. The black dots are the reference one by one CSR, so they're all running at about the same speed. And the blue is the best possible choice of R by C based on exhaustive search. So try all 144 different possible data structures exhaustively, and the blue is what you can do. And in the dense case, it gets very close to the dense code, right? To GEM, you know, take the dense matrix vector multiply, that's almost the same. These get very close to that, and then these have sort of less and less little, fewer and fewer dense blocks that you can take advantage of. So that's exhaustive search. We can't afford to do it. What about that heuristic that I told you about? Uh, the little green box is, when I do statistical sampling, this is how close we get. And it does a pretty good job of reproducing the results from exhaustive search. So, so you don't lose too much by doing it that way. And that green line there is dense matrix vector multiply, which is certainly an upper bound in how fast we can go. We're not going to go faster than that when it's a dense matrix. And finally, we also ask ourselves in this business, we model the hardware and we ask, how close are we to an upper bound on what the hardware can basically do? So how do we compute an upper bound? Well, we can do it in two ways. We can just look at our data structure and count how much compulsory memory traffic is there, right? Count the number of non-zeros, count the number of Xs you have to read, multiply that by the, you know, divide it by the bandwidth, all those kind of models, simple models I put up before, you can write down an upper bound and how fast it goes, and that gives you the blue line. And so you can see that, you know, how close are we to the blue line? You know, sometimes within a factor of two, sometimes closer. This tells us that we're doing a reasonable job. There's not much left to gain in sparse matrix vector multiply. The orange line is uh, using a hardware performance counter, which counts the actual uh, true memory traffic. And so that, uh, because sometimes you do more than compulsory misses, there's some other kinds of misses in the cache. And so that upper bound uh, is closer to what we can do. So, this is, so we have sort of several measures of success, which is you know, how much faster are we than the obvious way to do it, but also how close are we to some hardware-based limit. And, but still, this is way below the peak speed of this machine because one sparse matrix vector multiply, whatever you do, is going to be memory limited, even after I do all these optimizations. Okay. That was one optimization, register blocking. One out of a great number. I'm not going to tell you about the others in as much detail. Here's a list of some of the others, just to tell you how, how important they are. The first one that I've been telling you about is called register blocking, and we got up, up to a speed up of four times X over just the basic implementation. There's another optimization, which is pretty natural. If your matrix consists of, let's say, a bunch of eight by eight blocks and a bunch of three by three blocks, well, use different data structures for the eight by eights and the three by threes. That's called block splitting. That can give you another factor of 1.8 in, in the test matrices we did. Uh, some matrices are organized, they don't have a lot of dense blocks, but they have a lot of diagonals. They just happen to look like that. So you should store the diagonals in, as a single data structure and just know that they're diagonal. That can give you a factor of 2x over doing it the obvious way. Um, I will show you some pictures of this. Your matrix may have no dense blocks in it, but if you reorder the rows and columns, you may create a lot of dense blocks. I mean, the user, there's nothing necessarily sacred about the order of the rows and columns. You can change that. The algorithm might change a little bit, but you can get good speed ups that way, and uh, I'll show you there's factors of two available there. If your matrix is symmetric, obviously you only need to read in half of it. Uh, we can actually get more than a factor of two speed up by doing that. In fact, in fact a factor of 2.6, so we're just doing register blocking. Um, in addition to doing blocking for the memory hierarchy, which is registers, you also, there's also the cache, which we talked about in the dense case. There's another factor of 2.8 you can, you can get possibly. 
by blocking things to fit in the cache. One of the biggest speed ups is to say, if, you, if your algorithm happens to want to multiply not just by one vector at a time, but by many vectors, there's a factor of seven. Why is it so much bigger? Well, if I have 10 vectors to multiply by, I can reuse each entry of the matrix 10 times. The computational intensity goes up by a factor of 10. I get a lot more options to speed things up. And all of these can be combined. And what the OSCE auto-tuner does is it will try you know, combinations of these. Some of them it will do automatically. Some of them, because we have good heuristics, some of them require user hints because you know, it's, it's too expensive to try. We don't have a good heuristics. If the user gives a hint, I know you might want to try splitting it. It'll try that for you. Um, we've also done it for uh, triangular solve when it's a sparse matrix, and there's factors of 1.8 available there. But the real win we'll see is going to come from recognizing that your algorithm doesn't necessarily just want to multiply a single matrix vector multiply. It's a higher level algorithm. There's a, there's a more general kernel. So if you're finding a singular value decomposition, then you often want, want to multiply not by A, but by A transpose A. So it turns out that you, can, you only have to read the matrix A from memory once to do both of these matrix vector multiplications by reusing A cleverly. But you, know, you, have, to do, you, know, you have to know that's what your algorithm is going to do to, to do that optimization. And this one at the bottom, I'm going to say a lot more about it later. That's where we're going to get the big win. It turns out we're going to be able to compute all of these vectors, all k of them, for the cost of computing one. And we're going to get k-fold speedups. And you get to pick k. So let me just um, show you one more example of one of these tuning operations, which is this uh, accelerator cavity design problem. And I'm going to show you what the effect of reordering the rows and columns are. So if you're solving AX equal B and I change the order of the rows and columns, it obviously changes the AX equal B, but it's a pretty simple transformation. You just have to reorder the entries of X and B. So no big deal. So here's what it looks like. So, so imagine that I reordered the rows and columns. This is the same matrix that you just saw is on the previous slide. I've tried to push all of the non-zeros as close to the diagonal as I can. What is the algorithm that does this? It's called breadth first search. And for historical reasons, it's called reverse cut hill McKee. But who cares? It's breadth first search. And, and so on this, on, because this represents a graph. You know, there's a, uh, an edge between, row, uh, between vertex I and vertex J if there's a non-zero there. So let me just take that graph and do breadth first search on it and reorder the rows and columns in the order in which breadth first search orders them for me in reverse for some reason. This is what the matrix looks like. And so you can imagine if, I t if I've taken all those non-zeros and pushed them this close together, there's probably going to be a lot more dense blocks I can take advantage of. So let me zoom into the upper corner to see if that helped. So here's what the original matrix looked like before I did any reordering. I'm just zooming into the upper 100 by 100, and there are not very many dense blocks there. So now I'm going to do this, uh, this breadth first search, reverse cut hill McKee, and so I'm going to, it's color coded. So the location of the non-zeros <coughs> before I did reordering are green and red, and so the, the red ones are scattered everywhere. And after reordering, they're green and blue. So the green ones didn't move, and the red ones moved, the red dots moved into the blue location. So they all got crammed down toward the diagonal. And there are a lot more diagonal blocks there, aren't there? A lot more dense little blocks, because they're much, much closer together. So now I have the opportunity to do that register blocking that I didn't have before. But I can still do one more optimization. I can ask, is there any slight you know, twiddle I can do to make these blocks push closer together. And it turns out you can formulate that question as a traveling salesman problem. And if you know about, if you've taken a graph theory course, you know, traveling salesman problem is, you know, what's the shortest path to visit each city once? So what does that correspond to here? I have a city for each column of my matrix. And the distance between cities is how many non-zeros those two columns have in common. And I want to find not the shortest path, but the longest path. That pushes uh, adjacent columns together. And when I do that, that's the final reordering. And now I have lots and lots of great dense blocks. And if I use my uh, speed ups, uh, if I use this to now do register blocking, here are the speed ups I get on a variety of different machines. So there's all sorts of combinatorial interesting problems. But this is something we won't do automatically. The user has to know it's, that this might be worth trying. Give a hint to our system. Try reordering, and then it'll do it for you. It's too expensive to try without uh, a hint. Okay, so let's see. I started a little over an hour ago. What I'm going to do is finish. Uh, it's a two-hour talk with a break. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to uh, get to the end of tuning a single sparse metric spectrum multiply. Then we'll take a break in a few more slides and come back. Okay. So let me just tell you what the interface looks like, OSCE, Optimized Sparse Kernel Interface, that provides all of these tuning systems to you. And this is under active development. We're doing a, a parallel version right now. Uh, John Hobian, who's sitting in the back row, is busy working on this. It's called POSCE. But let me tell you what's available now, which is just all the sequential optimizations. So it sort of has a BLAS-like functionality. I mean, it's, so it's sort of you, you call several teams and do matrix vector multiply. It supports sparse matrix vector multiply, both by A and A transpose. In fact, you can ask it to multiply A times X and A transpose by Y in one subroutine call. Read A once to do that. And it also does a triangular solve, where you have a sparse triangular matrix. It tries to hide all this complexity that I've hinted at before. And it has some of these new kernels in it, but it doesn't have all the ones we need yet. And I've already told you it gets some good speed ups. And it's available as a standalone library. Um, and it's also available in, as a PETC extension. And uh, as I said, we're going to come out with a new release with luck by uh, supercomputing, but we'll see. So here is the architecture of the tuning system. And there's stuff that's done offline, and there's stuff that's done at runtime. Because we, we need to do as much of the expensive stuff offline as possible, but you know, some of it we have to wait until runtime. So for each target architecture, we're going to generate a lot of different code variants, you know, for 1 by 1 and 2 by 2 and 12 by 12, generate them all, benchmark them, and build a table of how fast each one goes. And, and here, we might also do SIMDization and all these other things, but we're going to, you know, store that in a, in, a, in a database that we can take as long as we want to build. So what happens at runtime? The user will supply the matrix. OSCE may also do some work, some uh, monitor your program. Right, every time you call matrix vector multiply, it will keep track of the fact that you did it and what your arguments were. And it'll, you know, and it'll try to learn from that. And it might also learn from history. You can say, this is the same matrix I did yesterday. It'll take advantage of that and not repeat itself. It'll evaluate those models <coughs> in the way I described to you, which is the best one. And it'll try to select the best data structure and code and give you back a handle that you can call that will just hide all the details inside. So, so here's, some, uh, here's some simple code to give you an example of what it looks like. So here's what your initial code may look like, and I'll show you on a couple more slides how to modify it just a little bit to call OSCE. So you, you have a data structure. You have a pointer uh, to, to your um, non-zero array, a pointer to your indices. Sorry, this is a pointer. Your indices are in this one, and the values. They're the indices, and this is where the rows begin. You have a vector x and you have a vector y. You want to do y equals a times x. And here's your loop 500 times. You're going to call your matrix, you know, my matrix multiply and do the matrix vector multiply. Uh, y equals alpha times a times x plus beta times y, the Blas interface. So how do I convert this code to use OSCE? Well, the first thing I need to do is to create wrappers that OSCE knows about your data structures. So I'm going to pass in my data structure to OSCE create matrix, given that it's in CSR format. And I'm going to pass in my vector x, and I'm going to pass in my vector y. And all this is going to be a lightweight copy. It's not going to actually do any copying yet. It's just going to keep track of it. Right? So that's the first thing you got to do. Then you call OSCE matrix multiply instead of your own. Right? So, so now you will potentially have all the speed up because you're calling OSCE's implementation. But I haven't done any tuning yet. I still have to tell OSCE that it, you got to do some tuning. So it knows the matrix exists. And at this point, it wouldn't do anything different than, you know, than vanilla CSR. So what you can do is give it some hints if you want. This is optional. You could say, um, I'm going to do it 500 times, so it's probably worth tuning. If I only was going to do it three times, it wouldn't be worth tuning. If you happen to know it had eight by eight blocks, you, you could tell the system you didn't have to. It could discover that itself. And then you say tune. This is where it goes off and does all that processing to figure out what the right algorithm is. And the inner loop doesn't change at all. Now when you call OSCE matrix multiply, it'll call the new optimized one, because that's associated with the matrix. The matrix a tunable knows what data structure, it knows what algorithm. So if you want to be lazy, you can just you know, create the wrapper around your matrix and then tune inside the loop. This sounds like a bad idea. You, I don't want to tune it 500 times, but OSCE is smart enough. What this is going to do is simply it's going to monitor your program. It's going to say, you called it once, you called it twice, you called it three times. Eventually, it'll say, it's worth tuning. And then it will slow down and do the copy. And, and the next time you call, it'll be fast. So that's sort of the other way that it works. OK, so let's now look at some performance results. 
And this is going to be performance results in the multi-core case. So now I'm going to throw in all the optimizations that are being added to, P to OSCE to create POSCE, but they're only in prototype form. So here are the four platforms that we're going to show you performance on. Uh, Intel Xeon, AMD Opteron, a Sun Niagara, and an IBM Cell Processor, which is maybe of less interest today, but it's, it's still an interesting platform to have tried it on. So you can see that all of these have slightly different architectures. You know, they're all multi-core, but how they're connected to the memory is quite different and all, all that sort of thing. So let me try to summarize the architectural differences to, so we can interpret which optimizations are important and which ones. So here are the, here are the four processors. Some of them are cache-based, these three, but the cell blade is local store-based. That means you are writing explicit code to move data when it's time to move the data, right? So that means stuff there is much harder to do. Um, the number of threads is quite different in all these platforms. In particular, um, the, uh, the uh, Victoria Falls has 128 threads, which you can use. It doesn't have 128 processors, but it has that many threads that can be swapped in and out quickly. Uh, these three platforms are non-uniform memory access, NUMA. That means uh, uh, if, you're in a, if you're going out to DRAM, some DRAM is closer than others, and so you have to make, you'd like to go to the close DRAM and not the faraway DRAM, and the algorithm has to take that into account. Uh, they all run at different peak speeds, so this is the, the peak speed of the machine. This is not necessarily going to reflect which ultimate machine is faster. Um, and they all have different um, memory bandwidth, so this is read-write bandwidth from DRAM, and it ranges from you know, 20 to 40 to 50, right? So that's maybe even more important. So these are the different platforms. Here, we're gonna I'm going to show you data on 14 different test matrices. We'll keep the dense one around, as usual. We'll have lots of these finite element matrices with nice dense structures in them, but we'll also have a bunch of hodgepodge ones, including you know, web matrices, and then one long skinny matrix that comes from linear programming, just to see what happens there. So let's start with doing it the naive way. So here I have four plots, one per processor. The horizontal axis is all the different matrices, all 14 different matrices from dense on this side, and then the median performance over on that side. Vertical axis is gigaflop, so up is good. The purple line in every case is the naive code, okay? So sequential. And the blue on top of it is paralyzing it in the simplest possible way, naive p-thread. So every processor just gets an equal number of rows. You know, it's embarrassingly parallel. It should parallelize perfectly, right? Uh, and on each of these, we can ask ourselves, how close to perfect speed up do we get? And just to remind you, how many threads do I have? 8, 8, 128, and 16. And you can see that this is not very close to an 8-fold speed up. <laughs> You know, the blue is not eight times higher than the purple, and uh, on this is pretty good, but you know, it's not 128, but this is our starting point. So this is, now we're going to add a bunch of optimizations. And so the first thing I'm going to do, let me get this right, um, is add NUMA aware allocation so that instead of going to the far away DRAM, I'm going to make sure that each processor has its submatrix allocated in the nearby DRAM. And I'm also, and that's the NUMA optimization, that's the uh, light blue bar. This machine is not NUMA, so it doesn't matter. The light blue bar only appears there and there. And I'm also going to do prefetching, right? There are special instructions in these machines where you can say, I'm going to need this data soon. Please start getting it out of DRAM. There are special hardware instructions to do that. That's prefetching. And, but there's a parameter to that instruction. How far ahead do you want me to prefetch? Next two words, four words, eight words. So there's a tuning space. And this used exhaustive search. It tried all possible prefetch distances to try to get the best one, and that gave you the uh, green line. So the top of, these, of each of these bars is you've done every optimization, and you've gotten up to that bar. Okay? So these are all important. It doesn't work very well on the cell blade. This is all... Cell blade, eventually you have to write special purpose code for it. Um, okay. So now I finally put in the register block. I hadn't done that yet. So now I'm going to throw in that first optimization I told you about and in all the other formats to diagonal, whatever works well. I'm also going to take advantage of the fact that if I have a little cache block, then I might not need 32-bit words, 32-bit indices to store it. I might only get away with 16-bit indices. I'll use that in that case, because that cuts that memory traffic down by a factor of half. I'm going to call all those techniques together compression, right, making the matrix smaller, and that gets me to the top of the yellow block. And here, there, there were too many choices, so it used a heuristic instead of exhaustive search. And so this, now I'm going to throw in, and I've changed the vertical axis here just so I can get everything to fit. So the, the peak now was 8. Now I'm going to make it 16 because 
otherwise it won't fit. I'm going to throw in cache blocking, local store blocking, and TLB blocking. So the TLB is a translation look aside buffer. It has to do with how pages are done. And if you do all of that, depending on the platform, you get a little bit more. But not, and, and maybe and the one where it makes the biggest difference, cache blocking is important for this very, very long, skinny linear programming matrix on Opteron. That's the one where it paid off significantly. Most of the other cases, it didn't. And finally, if you say, the heck with all this, I'm going to write it all by hand, that's what happens on the cell blade. <laughs> and because none of this is a, you know, a very unique architecture, and if you just do it all special purpose, then, then it kind of works there. But for the other ones, this is what you get. And it's, you know, I, I don't have comparisons to, to the peak for this, but this is, this is the best that we have done. And, and all of these are, are useful. It gives you a very large design space. And they'll be included in, in the Pioski system. And, and they're the final uh, speed ups, just to summarize. So 35 over the naive code, right? That's because you got to do it all by hand to get the speed up on that platform. OK, so that is the end of all of my discussion of, of tuning a single sparse matrix vector multiply. E even though these are good speed ups, you'd like them, they're still gonna be, it's still going to be memory bandwidth limited, because I'm still only doing two flops per non-zero in the matrix. So the only way I can get past that limit is to reorganize the entire algorithm. Not just the sparse matrix vector multiply, but everything else. The whole conjugate gradient algorithm, the whole Lanchos algorithm. And so let me tell you that, start telling you that story. So a typical iterative solver, I'm going to take k steps, you know, many, many steps. And, and what, does that, what do I do? I'm going to do k sparse matrix vector multiplies. I'm going to get k vectors. And then I'm going to choose some linear combination of those k vectors to find the best solution. And depending on your definition of best, you get all of these different methods which people have invented over many years. So my goal is going to be to minimize communication, minimize the number of times I have to go read the matrix from memory or those vectors from memory. And for all of this stuff to work, I'll, I'll have pictures to explain this word in a moment, I'm going to assume my matrix is well partitioned. I talked about surface to volume ratios before when I divided up regions of the plane. I'm going to make a similar assumption about the graphs that underlie my sparse matrices. So if you like, the simplest matrix that would work well is a finite element matrix. Everybody is kind of connected to their near, just their nearest neighbors in, in 2D or 3D. Matrices like that are well partitioned. And, and other ones are too. But if you want to have one example in mind, just keep that one in mind. So let me describe what we can do in parallel and sequential. In the parallel case, Imagine I take k steps of my method. I'm going to do k sparse matrix vector multiplies. And so my cost is going to, uh, my communication cost is going to grow proportionally to k. In fact, in the inner loop, I have to do a dot product. That costs me log p messages. So my cost is going to grow proportionally to k log p. The new algorithm is independent of k. It's independent of how many steps I take. It's going to be optimal. It's going to cost me one reduction to take k steps of the algorithm. That's the parallel case. And the, in the sequential case, again, I'm going to take k steps of the conventional algorithm. I've got to read my huge sparse matrix out of DRAM k times. So that's k moves of the data from slow to fast memory. I'm going to take those k steps and move the matrix once from DRAM to, to fast memory. And you can't do better than once. OK. So there's going to be lots of speed up possible. I'm going to show you some models and some measurements. The price we're going to pay is we're going to do more flops. We're going to do some redundant computation. But as I said, flops are cheap, so that's often worth the trade-off. And so let me show you what the algorithm looks like by illustrating it on the world's simplest, almost the simplest, sparse matrix you can imagine, a tridiagonal matrix. right? So it's only non-zero on the main diagonal, right above and right below, so I can draw every detail. And I'm going to, in fact, it's going to be a 32 by 32 matrix, so I can have a dot for every row. So each of these dots represents x, x1, x2, x3, x4, up to x32. And what I want to compute is all the entries of a times x. So there's the first, second, third entry. All the entries of a squared x and all the entries of a cubed x. And I want to access a as few times as possible. So I'm just going to do this with pictures. And so what you should imagine is that because my matrix is tridiagonal, what information do I need to compute the third entry of ax? Well, I need x2, x3, and x4 because the matrix is tridiagonal. So there's this dependency that appears everywhere here. And to make the pictures a little easier to understand, I'm just going to draw the dependency that way. So at the tip of the triangle, the thing I want to compute depends on everybody inside the base of the triangle. So just imagine that little dependency graph. It's replicated everywhere. So for example, that entry of a cubed x depends on those three entries of a squared x, because it's the same tridiagonal matrix. 
And if I just continue those dependencies down, then, and I, I can say what, entry, what entries of the original vector x does that entry of a cube depend on? It depends on everybody at the base of the triangle. Right? So this is sort of a simple you know, graph traversal kind of thing. You can see what the pattern is. OK. So now, let's suppose I want to compute all those entries of a cubed x, everybody along the top of that trapezoid. How many entries of x do I need? It's everybody at the base of the trapezoid. Right? Those, that's what the data dependency looks like. So this is my basic picture of what, who depends on whom. And I want to use that to partition the work, either you know, what do I have in cash at one time, or which processor is responsible for what. So let me talk about the sequential algorithm. So what I want to do is compute every black dot, every entry of ax, a squared x, and a cubed x, and I only want to read a from memory once. That's my lower bound. So what am I going to do? Let's suppose I can only fit about a quarter of the matrix into cache at a time. So I'll start by reading in the first quarter of the entries of a x, the first quarter of the rows of a, and I, now I have enough information to fill in everything in that trapezoid. Right? I can compute him because he depends on all of those. I can compute him because he depends on all of those. But I can't compute him because you know, it depends on something out there. That's what I can do. Now, suppose I finish that. What do I do next? That's the next step. I'm going to read in these entries of x, these rows of a, uh, but I'm going to leave in memory those entries of x um, and, and those. I'm going to need these two, leave these two diagonals behind because, for example, to compute him, I need that guy and I need that guy. So I just leave a little bit of, of information behind most of this stuff put out in the cache. And now I have all the information I need to do step two and fill in all the red entries. I do all of those. Then I read in the next entries of x, the next rows of a, keep just two of these diagonals around. I can fill in that part. And there's the fourth part. And so uh, this picture says for the cost of reading in a just once, I have filled in every one of these entries. So that's sort of the picture. This is an ancient picture. I mean, this, this idea has been around for a while. So for a, for a simple matrix like tridiagonal. So that's the sequential algorithm. What about the parallel algorithm? So imagine now I have four processors. And so processor one is going to be responsible for the first quarter of the entries. Processor two is going to be responsible for those. So what is processor two going to need to compute? If he's going to compute everything in this rectangle, what information does he need? Well, his dependency says he needs those three entries and he needs those three entries. So how am I going to do that with as little communication as possible? Oops. I'm going to take these three numbers in processor 3, package them up into one message, and send them all at once to processor 2. And processor 1 is going to package up all of these three numbers in one message and send them to processor 2 as well. So I only have to talk to my neighbors once. That's where the latency cost goes down. And now processor 2 has all the information he needs to compute everything in that red trapezoid. Now, every processor is going to do the same thing. So I'm going to, every processor is going to have a trapezoid. And the trapezoids, of course, are going to overlap. So this is the redundant work that happens. Processor 1 is going to have to compute everybody in this pink triangle. And processor 2 is going to have to compute everybody in that pink triangle. But as long as I have a lot of my local work, the size of this little extra triangle at the end is pretty small. Right? That's what this low surface to volume ratio is, that the, that the the stuff at the ends is small compared to my, I have a big matrix, compared to everything in the middle. So, and so the redundant work is going to be relatively small. So that's the picture of the dependencies on the simplest matrix you can imagine, which is tridiagonal. But it all works for general sparse matrices. So let me just try to describe that with a picture. So here is a picture of a sparse matrix written as a graph. There's one row and column for every vertex. And let's just pretend it's a symmetric matrix. And there's an edge for every non-zero. So if this is row i and that's row j, that edge means a sub i j is non-zero. So that's what this data structure means. And suppose I've distributed it to processors, and, and the uh, yellow lines or orange lines say which processor owns which part of the matrix and which of the non-zeros. So the guy in the middle owns all this gray stuff. OK. So the question is, what does this processor need to do in order to compute ax, a squared x, and a cubed x just for all of these rows that are colored gray? Well, to compute AX, he needs all the data he owns, plus follow the edges to all the red vertices. To compute that entry, he needs that one and that one, because this edge means this entry depends on him, and it depends on him. So all the red ones, one edge away in a breadth-first search, are all of the information he needs from his neighbors. What about A squared X? Well, you just follow two edges out, and you get to the green guys. So 
he depend, to get AX, you need red. To get A squared X, you need red and green. And for A cubed, you do one more step of breadth first search and get to the blue guys. So what are we going to do in one message? This processor is going to package up the red, the green, and the blue information and ship it to the guy in the middle. And every neighbor will do the same. So it'll be exactly one message communication for processor. And if I'm doing the sequential algorithm, I'm going to be you know, walking through these uh, regions in some order, and I'll leave just enough information behind so that I can compute everything necessary in the next region. So the idea that was very simple before, I sort of just processed my, my matrix from left to right. And you know, just, you know, the first processor got the first quarter of the rows, the next processor got the next quarter of the rows, the really easy thing. That changes into the graph partitioning problem. How do I draw these lines so that every processor owns about an equal number of vertices and I have as, have as few edge crossings as possible? And that's one of those patterns I talked about in the first day, graph partitioning, well-studied problem. The other thing that was easy in the tridiagonal case is what order does the sequential algorithm work in, left to right or top to the bottom of the matrix? There is no obvious left to right anymore. But if you write it down, that turns into a traveling salesman problem. What order should I process all of these uh, partitions in to minimize the amount of data that has to be moved from main memory, and it's the traveling salesman problem. So we know how to generalize all of these ideas to general sparse matrices. Okay, so what about multi-core? Now, the thing about multi-core is there's two kinds of communication. There's between processors on the chip, and then even more expensive, it's between the on-chip cache and the off-chip DRAM. So I have two kinds of communication that I want to minimize. So in fact, what our implementations do is they use both those tricks I just showed you. They use one partition to minimize the off-chip DRAM bandwidth, and they use, then once they get a bunch of stuff on chip, they use the second trick to minimize the communication between the different cores. And you've got to do both. And when you do that, here's some of the speed-ups that we got. This was on an Intel Cloverton, so a little bit old, an eight-core machine. There's one uh, uh, bar for, every one of a different, for lots of different sparse matrices. This is a, a simple five diagonal matrix, band matrix, where everything should work really well. It's, it's not quite tridiagonal, but it's the, the easy case I showed you. Here's a 2D matrix where you're just uh, connected to your nearest neighbors in a 2D mesh. And all of these others are real matrices from some online database of real sparse matrices. And, the re and, and up is good, up is performance. And the uh, red line is how fast a single sparse matrix vector multiply goes. And the green line is how much faster this kernel went. Now, we have a new tuning parameter, which is what's the optimal size of K, right? How big should, you know, how many steps should I go out to? A to the seventh, A to the fifth. That's the tuning parameter, and that varies from matrix to matrix. So for the simplest case, the pentadiagonal matrix, it went six times faster, and choosing K equals 50 was a good idea. So we went out really far. Um, for this matrix, which was some finite element model of a ship, uh, it didn't pay to go past k equals 3 because it had a lousy surface to volume ratio and we only got a 50% speed up. Eh, it's still worth doing, right? So it varies very much from matrix to matrix and it's one of these tuning problems. Okay, so now that's our kernel. The question is, how do I reorganize the entire solver, right? I now have to go back and say I want to solve ax equal b. What do I do to reorganize all of that? And so let me just show you what that algebraic reorganization looks like. So this slide of the slide is the classical algorithm called generalized minimum residual. And you don't have to worry about it too much. So here's what it looks like. I'm going to take k steps of the algorithm. I'm going to do a matrix vector multiply, sparse matrix vector multiply. And then I'm going to take that vector that I got, just computed, and make it orthogonal to all the previous vectors by running this algorithm called Gram-Schmidt to make it orthogonal. That gives me a new vector. And then I do some little stuff, you know, some cheap operations, and I get my new vector, and I keep going, and I do that k times. And so the cost is going to be k copies of the matrix A from slow memory to fast memory and, and lots and lots of vector operations. So what does the new algorithm look like? It's much, much shorter, actually. I'm going to, in one step that I just described to you, compute all of these vectors, and I'm going to get a matrix W of, of, with, with k plus 1 columns. Then I'm going to compute its QR decomposition using that dense tall, skinny QR algorithm I told you about in the first half of the lecture. And that gives me the same orthogonal vectors that I would have gotten from this over here. Uh, and then I have to reorganize the rest of the algorithm and, to, and, and so forth. I won't show all the details. But I only have to do one copy of A in the vectors between slow and fast memory. So, so this is what the algorithm looks like. Different 
algebraic reorganizations are necessary for conjugate gradient and all the other flavors, but this is sort of the basic idea. I'm going to compute a different basis of my space, but they span the same space, so I can still find the right linear combination that I want for my answer. So let me confirm that I still get the right answer, right? I've, I've changed the algebra, and if you're used to floating point arithmetic, you might be a little paranoid about whether you get the same answer or not. Everything here is exactly correct in exact arithmetic, but floating point is a different world. So let me do an experiment, and I'll, I'll just try this algorithm on some simple matrix. And the horizontal axis is how many iterations I take, and the vertical axis is the log of the residual, so it should you know, go down. The black curve is the classical uh, algorithm, and it is converging. It slows down after a while. And the blue one is the algorithm I just showed you, and it doesn't converge very well at all. Now, the reason for that, going back here, is that all of these vectors, this is actually the page rank algorithm. <laughs> it's it keeps multiplying a vector by the same matrix. All of these vectors get more and more nearly parallel to one another, and it turns into a lousy basis for the, for the subspace because all the vectors are almost all pointing in the same direction, so I don't have very much information in them. And so this algorithm, even though it's perfect in exact arithmetic, is not quite right. So I have to fix it. And the fix is, here's version two, is that instead of doing ax, a squared x, a cubed x, that's one set of polynomials, a, a squared, a cubed, I can choose any other polynomials I want, as long as they have the right degree. And as, if I do the math right, and I pick the right polynomials, the problem goes away. I have to pick the right polynomials. All the, it doesn't cost any more. It's very cheap, same as before. Then all of these vectors are perfectly good. They're not becoming nearly parallel to one another. And it costs the same. So how does that affect the convergence? It works just fine. If I pick the right polynomials, which I know how to do, then the convergence behaves just like the normal way. So you have to get the computer science right, and you have to get the math right in order to get the, uh, these algorithms to work, which makes it an interesting tuning space. So let me show you some overall speedups now of the overall solver. And these are all the different matrices. The vertical axis is normalized, so the classical algorithm is normalized to speed one. And, the vertical, and this is how much faster the new algorithm goes. So you can see it goes 2.3 times faster, 2.1 times faster, and so forth. And the color coding is, shows you how much time was spent in the sparse stuff and the dense stuff. The point being, both had to be done right in order to get the speed up. So, so uh, let me compare the, um, the blue bar, which is the old sparse matrix kernel, just do sparse matrix vector multiply over and over again, to the new one, which does it uh, a bunch of powers at the same time, and the blue shrank to the red. That was an important part of the speed up. And if I compare the purple to the red and the or to the orange and the yellow, that was the dense linear algebra. And that was also important to make it speed up. The purple here shrank to the yellow and the orange. So both parts were necessary depending on the matrix structure. Now, the first time we did this, I should say, um, we had one person independently tune the sparse linear algebra, make it go as fast as possible, lots of hand tuning. And a different person tuned all the dense linear algebra, made it go really fast. And we put them together and we tried the algorithm. It was terrible. It slowed down dramatically. And the reason was that when they were tuned independently and you put them together, they started fighting one another over the cache and the memory bandwidth. They had to be tuned together. So we had to go back and say, let's tune all the parameters knowing that we're going to call one after the other in an alternating fashion. And then the speed ups occurred. So the tuning problem is no longer library by, you know, you know subroutine by subroutine, you know, dense library, sparse library. You've got to tune the whole algorithm. And then it works. OK, so let me now summarize what is known and what's open in this business. So um, the algorithm I just told you about is that there are two parameters to choose, the k. that We're going to choose that to optimize the speed. And then there's how many steps do I take to optimize convergence. And we can tune those separately. So the numerical analysts are going to tune r, and the computer scientists are going to tune k to get to optimize the convergence. I already mentioned we need to co-tune these kernels. You can't tune them separately. Um, I have to choose the polynomials right, and there's a lot of theory about that I haven't gone into. Uh, and then it seems to work pretty well. So we have figured out how to do a lot of other uh, Krilov methods. So Arnoldi and Lanchos are well-known methods for finding eigenvalues and singular values. Uh, the conjugate gradient algorithm uh, for solving AX equal B works, where the A is symmetric and positive definite. And very, very recently, in fact, the tech report was done yesterday, uh, we figured out how to do these other ones where your matrix is non-symmetric. And uh, 
and the algebra is much more complicated, but it also works for these. So one thing that a number of people ask us for is how do you handle preconditioning? So the way it often works, you want to solve AX equal B, and A is too hard for some reason, it's very ill-conditioned. So what people often do in practice is they say, I'm going to replace my matrix A by pre-multiplying it by M. This has the same solution. But I'm going to pick M so that M times A is easier by some metric. It's better conditioned. And the trouble, so now, how do I reorganize all my algorithms to make that work? It turns out that the kernel that I need to minimize communication is alternating products of A and M. This is what I need to compute with as little communication as possible. And so the question is, what properties does M have that people like, the numerical analysts like, because they have good math properties? Which one of those also have the good computer science properties so I can minimize communication? We are in the process of, of you know, we've identified a few, and we're in the process of sort of working on that, and there's a bunch of people at DOE who are interested in particular ones that work. So we're, and, and um, in addition to that tech report that just got finished yesterday, I don't know if it's posted yet, Mark Homan's PhD thesis has a lot of these details. Okay, so this is my uh, next to last slide about the sparse matrix stuff. All of this started by assuming that my matrix was given to me. I have an explicit list of non-zero entries, values, and I have an explicit list of where they are, where they're stored. And that's standard sparse matrix vector multiplying. It turns out, in practice, there are a lot of other ways that users give you sparse matrices. You can use a lot of the same ideas, but the tuning is quite different. The other way you can do it is your sparse matrix may be given to you entirely implicitly. It may be just a little piece of code that says, for every point in this two-dimensional grid, compute an average with your nearest neighbors, and it's the same average everywhere. You don't have to bother writing down that matrix because you can represent it in a much more compact way. If you're doing image recognition or climate modeling or various or other kinds of problems, you may have the values given to you explicitly. You can't get rid of those. But where they are located is implicit. It's a little piece of code. You don't have any you know, indices to store. And all of the optimizations, again, change. That comes up in a lot of applications. And finally, sometimes the, the location is given to you explicitly, but the values are implicit. That comes up in the graph partitioning problem that I was telling you about. And then it may be static or it may be changing dynamically. So the point is we have to be able to mix all of these different tuning techniques that I was telling you about, depending on which how the information is given to us. But many of the same ideas apply. So there's lots of work to do. So finally, I think this is my last slide on sparse stuff. So fast code must minimize communication. If you just do a single sparse matrix vector multiply, you're going to be limited, be communication bound. We have to think at a higher level about optimizing the whole algorithm. Uh, we still have to generate fast code for a single sparse matrix vector multiply. That's still useful in a lot of ways. There's a big design space. We're going to search it automatically, and at runtime, pick the best one to do. Um, to get the best speed ups, you have to transform the entire algorithm, the entire land shows, the entire GM reds. And there's lots of open problems in how to do that large scale transformation. And this website here has a lot of information about it. OK, so that ends the two main parts of the talk which is tuning dense linear algebra and tuning sparse linear algebra. And I have a little bit to say, courtesy of collaborator Sam Williams, about uh, the two other uh, patterns. Let's see, I only have 10 minutes. One is about structured grids, and the other is about particle methods, pushing particles around. So actually, I only have time for one. I, this usually happens. So does anybody, well, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. So you have a choice. You can either hear about structured grids or you can hear about particle methods. Who wants to hear about structured grids? Okay. And who would like to hear about particle methods? I think particle methods wins. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So... I'm going to talk about two different kinds of particle methods. One, and I mentioned them both in my talk yesterday, one of them is particle in cell. That's where you have a bunch of particles that they live wherever they want to live. You move them a little bit to the nearest point on a mesh. You solve the problem on where the particles are now on this nice regular mesh because that's, you can do that really fast with FFTs or multigrid. And then you use that information to interpolate back the forces on the original particles. 
That's the particle and cell. And I'll have a little bit to say about the fast multipole method, too, at the end. This is all work in progress. So there are three steps to this algorithm, as I said. I have to move each particle to its nearest mesh point. Or, in fact, I may do a little bit of weighted averaging. I may you know, add a little bit of weight there, 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 and there to, you know, to sort of smooth out the information in particle one. Then I have to do, solve my Poisson equation, do FFTs, do multigrid. I'm not going to worry about that part. That's a separate fast thing to do. And then, once I have the information to each of these points, I need to each one of these guys, I need to average the values at all the grid points to get his value, to, you know, the force on him. That's easy. That's read only of a bunch of data. Poisson solve is a separate problem. The bottleneck turns out to be the first part, which is everybody has to increment um, a value at the nearest grid cell. It's like com you're computing a histogram. It's like a two-dimensional histogram. Everybody sort of just contributes a little bit to the nearest point. That turns out to be the bottleneck because everybody's trying to hit the same things at the same time. And so, in particular, in shared memory, you know, how do I keep these race conditions from happening and update things as fast as possible without becoming entirely sequential? So um, there are going to be two. It's going to depend on the. There, there are a lot, there's a big de uh, design space again. Uh, that, that's particular to the particle and cell method. And the answer is going to depend on what your application looks like. So I'm going to give you data for two applications. One is simulation of a heart, and the other is simulation of a, uh, a gyrokinetic uh, fusion reactor. Okay, so different applications here. So here, the heart is, is modeled as a bunch of fibers in a fluid, blood. And at every time step, the heart moves a little bit. That imposes a force on the, on the blood. You solve the blood flow equations, and then you put the forces back on the fibers in the heart. So the particles are the heart muscle fibers, and the mesh is the fluid. And in this case, the particles are some ions floating around in the plasma. And the, then you do a Poisson solve to solve the electrostatic forces. And then you put the electrostatic forces back on the particles. So they have very different distributions of where the particles are. And so different optimizations are going to give you different ways of doing things. So here, all the particles are sort of smeared around kind of uniformly inside this big torus, this big fusion reactor. And your heart, obviously, is not smeared around so much. It, you know, it's kind of the particles don't move very far. They're heart, mu heart muscles. OK, so what are the um, uh, tuning, what's the tuning space look like? There's different, we're trying to compute this histogram. So we have to decide, how does everybody do the updating in a reasonable way? So there's five different synchronization approaches that were attempted, three different ways of doing locking. Uh, there's something called floating point atomics. Some of these machines have special instructions where you can just lock one uh, location in memory and do an update to it, add to it, and come back. And then there is sort of don't do anything at all, hope for the best. That sort of gives you a, a, an upper bound on how fast you can go if you don't worry about getting the right answer. Um, the other trick that you can use is to have uh, is to replicate the histogram, right? So everybody has their own copy of the data, and they update it locally, don't have to worry about synchronization. Then when you're all done, you do a big reduction and add up everybody's separate histogram into one place. And there are several ways to do that. You can, you know, you can, you can uh, you know, completely replicate the grid over every processor, which is incredibly expensive. Um, you can change it dynamically depending on where things are. There's a big design space. I'm not going to try to do the details given the time. Okay. So there's a lot less memory than MPI code if, with, with complete replication, right? So in shared memory, you can take advantage of the fact that the histogram can be shared among all the processors. It, so that's a very you know, good application of using shared memory instead of MPI. So, and the answer is going to depend on all of these different things. So let me just show you some, some examples. So this is for the heart simulation. And uh, the vertical axis is gigaflops. And so up is good. There are different optimization strategies. And there's three different multi-core platforms in which the speed-ups are going. And so this is where everything is shared. Uh, and and there's, you have to synchronize your, and you pick the best synchronization scheme for you know, locking each piece of it to update it. This is where you partition the histogram, and everybody gets a piece of it, and you do a reduction at the end. And this is where you replicate it, uh, and everybody gets a, a, a copy, either a complete copy or a little subset of it, which is chosen dynamically. And so you can see that there's different speed-ups on different machines for doing this. Sometimes things go faster, sometimes things go slower. It's architecture dependent. This is the usual auto-tuning story. And here's the story for the fusion reaction. And it's different. Different optimizations work best. And um, indeed, here's for the comparison with MPI, just to show that you can go a lot faster. So 
I don't have any you know, lessons that one optimization is better than another. It's application dependent and it's architecture dependent. So that's all I wanted to say about a little bit about the design space for particle methods. Now I'm going to talk about fast multipole. And this is the case, just to remind you, this is the idea where the Andromeda galaxy is a billion stars in it, but I'm going to approximate it by a point mass. Conversely, the Milky Way looks like a point mass to the Andromeda galaxy. And if I look inside the Milky Way, our solar system looks like a point mass when you're on the planet Vulcan and vice versa, right? Okay, so I'm just going to do that recursively. And the data structure to divide up the universe is going to be a three-dimensional box broken down this way, where I'm going to keep dividing things smaller and smaller depending on how many stars are in it. And so there, the algorithm is going to have to do a lot of traversals of this tree. So I'm implicitly building a tree, and I have to keep traversing it up and down over and over again to build all of these summarizations of the particles inside and, and, and so forth. And there's a new algorithm that's being used for this called kernel independent fast multipole, which is a wonderful generalization. The original algorithm was only good for inverse square law stuff, electrostatics, gravity. People have realized that it applies to anything uh, as long as the potential function gets smooth when you're far away from it. Right? It doesn't have to be inverse square, it could be anything. And so this kernel independent stuff basically says if you give me a black box that evaluates the potential, I can build an order n fast multipole algorithm that uses your potential. It can be anything you want as long as it you know, gets simple when you get far away. And so that's what they're trying to tune here. And it does lots of FFTs of little sizes inside. Um, this was attempted both on CPUs and GPUs. So, so one of the big bits of the tuning difference there is that how small do I make these boxes? Because remember, all the particles inside the box, I run the direct n squared algorithm. So I don't want very many particles inside a box. But if you're on a GPU, which is really fast, you can do have much, much bigger boxes than if you were on a CPU because the speed is so much faster to run the direct method. So uh, here's some examples of, of speed ups and different optimizations. So it turns out that on Nehalem, how far down, how, do I make, how small do I make the boxes where I run the direct method? 250 particles. At that point, I run the n squared algorithm, the 250 squared algorithm. On GPUs, I st I'd go to the n squared algorithm and I hit 4,000 because the GPU is just so good at these inner loops that, that do the uh, direct application, I'm perfectly happy to do 4,000 squared of those direct applications. So that may give me a very different tree structure on GPUs than I do on CPUs. But so here again are all the different phases of traversing up and down this quad tree or oct tree. So, and the speed up is on the vertical axis, so up is good. So, and this was on Barcelona and the Halem and Victoria Falls, the same set of three different um, multi-core platforms. So doing SIMDization, all of these have SIMD instructions. That's a low-level optimization. It turned out there is an inverse. This was doing inverse square, so it has to compute a lot of reciprocal square roots. That took a lot of time. So it was just replaced by a, a cheap Newton approximation to the reciprocal square root. That gave you this yellow speed up. I mean, it's, it's simple, but it was a good idea. There's all sorts of data structures. It could be structures of array or arrays of structs. Doing that optimization gave you the green speed up, reorganizing the data structure. And then... This is sort of a detail inside the kernel independent fast multipole. You can either build these matrices at each box and multiply by them explicitly or do it in a matrix free way. And uh, anyway, so these are all the speed ups that you got, which are very algorithm dependent, but you know, it was worth doing, very large speed ups. So, and uh, relative to the performance out of the box on Nehalem, so Nehalem is one, up is good. The speed ups were anywhere between 10 and 100 by the time all of these optimizations were added. But it depends on whether your particles are uniformly distributed or you know, lying on a surface of an ellipse. Uh, you get very different shapes of your trees and you get different optimizations. So again, this is stuff that an expert understands and you don't necessarily want the user to be exposed to it all, but you do want your factors of 10 and 100, right? So the question is, how are we actually gonna deliver this to, to users? And my very last slide is the answer to that. This is my last slide. <laughs> this is ongoing research at, in the PAR lab, which is how do we take all these different teams of people, not just here, building auto-tuners and make them easily available to any programmer, right, without having to totally you know, reorganize their code to recognize these patterns. And the hope is that somebody could write a program in Python and put in a few hints that say, I'm running this motif, I'm using you know, this few ideas, and the system will recognize that and reorganize your code for you. So this is not the magic compiler. It depends on clever people having written auto-tuners 
And it depends on some hints from the user, right? So there is no magic here. It, it requires you know, a lot of people having done this. So the idea is that if you just write pure Python and you evaluate a function, it'll get executed at some you know, slow speed, OK? So the other thing that happens is that you may have a function, like a matrix multiply, which is recognized by the system. I'll tell you what CGIT stands for. It's an acronym. And it's going to call a specializer, an auto-tuner. And it's going to say, oh, I know that you're calling a particular function on a particular platform. I know how to do that better. It'll maybe generate some C code for you. It'll put that in a database so it'll be used the next time. And it's going to execute that code for you instead. And this is all going to happen at runtime. So why is this called um, a, why is it called CGITS? So it's going to be selective. There are only some functions which, we know, which are going to be known how to optimize, right? Ones that correspond to the motifs. The other ones are just going to run in Python. It's going to be embedded because you don't see it. It's sort of lying underneath your Python code. And it's going to be just in time. It's going to happen at runtime. And it, it may be in, involved you know, grabbing a code from a database and running it before. And it's going to be specialized to your hardware and to your application. So that's what CGIT stands for. Selected, Embedded, Just-in-Time Specialization. And that is sort of the framework with which we're hoping to deliver all of these disparate auto-tuners to a large group of uh, Python programmers and, and other high-level language programmers. So um, that is that was my second to last slide. Here's a summary of the whole talk. So we have these very large design spaces for algorithms. The implementations are large and growing. Finding the best algorithm by hand is getting harder and harder. And so ideally, we're going to build this database of techniques over time where you know, smart people collect all their ideas together. Um, and every time a new architecture, a new problem goes along, you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, we have some ideas about how to do that, but there's a lot of work to do. So, and I will stop there. Thank you. Okay.